Hello and welcome. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the first day of MM7 Moodle MOOC 7. This is uh, Nelly Deutsch, not Kurt, so you hear my voice. I'm going to be going to another class where you'll see my name and I'll be um, moderating the chat box. Um, if you could just add where you're coming from and tell us, is the sound okay? Is it not okay? Is it too loud? Is it too low? How's the temperature where you are? Any information that you'd like to add is perfect. If you don't see me, you So there I am. So you know it's not Kurt. Uh, Professor Kurt is going to be here. He's in the background. He's going to appear in a couple of uh, seconds. So where is everyone coming from? I see Greece, Poland, Ukraine, Venezuela. You're welcome to um, use the chat, as I said, and uh, welcome each other as people come in. All right, so let's get started so we won't take any more of um, your time. Hello, Claudia. Good to see you. It's so wonderful to see people I haven't seen for a while, to see you here. Um, Kurt Bunk is a professor at Indiana University. Uh, he started out as a CPA. If you don't know what that is, it's boring, as he will tell you. It's an accountant, and there he's coming on. You'll see him in a minute. Um, and he went into teaching, believe it or not, because uh, that's the best thing, the best career in this world is teaching. He travels a lot. I met Kurt um, in Finland, believe it or not. Uh, two years ago. It was really an amazing meeting. Uh, he just appeared all of a sudden in a workshop that I uh, was about to start. Uh, it's always great to meet people face to face after you know them for a number of years online. He has an amazing uh, resume, as you can see. This is just a little bit. He writes, he uh, entertains. I'm going to put that in the middle. Um, he has a good time teaching both face-to-face -face and online. And if you remember what I said in the previous session about pain or pleasure and that you have a choice, well, this is your chance to uh, have the pleasure of uh, listening to uh, Professor Kurt Bunk, our uh, presenter. So, Curtis, if you're in the background there and you're... Today, there's a lot of... Uh, interesting things in the air to ponder, let's put it that way. Now, here in the US of A, we had a, a trick-or-treat day yesterday, and I brought some of you some candy, if you would like some candies. If you didn't get any candies yesterday, I've got them all for all of you to share. Maybe it's not your favorite kind of candy, but I've got candy nonetheless. And of course, if you're going to be trick-or-treating, uh, I've got a whole bag of candy for all of you. Mina, I'll bring it Tuesday to class. If you're going to be trick-or-treating, you need to have a Halloween costume of some sort, right? So this was the Halloween costume I got yesterday, real cheap uh, one that I didn't even wear because the kids were here so quickly. Uh, about 80 kids came to the door all at once. I didn't get a chance to give anyone any candy, so I'm wearing my Halloween outfit here today for all of you. Uh, it is a Viking helmet. That's not actually what I'm going to wear. Uh, today, for all of you, I've got my pink suit on and my pink hat. So as you can see, I'm layered in my, my pink suit I got in Vietnam last year. So why pink? I don't know. It's something that catches you a little bit in the morning here or the afternoon for some of us in the USA. So uh, and maybe evening for people in India and around the world. So let's go into this area of MOOCs and open education, recent news and research clues. Uh, maybe a catchy little title, I don't know. But this area of MOOCs and open education has exploded around the world. Wherever I visit, you can pick a point, and there's someone, well, I guess not in the Pacific, South Pacific Ocean. Well, maybe. Um, that's the Atlantic, actually. But if we go to South America, if we could click over to uh, Australia and New Zealand, where I'll be in April down in New Zealand, wherever, and, and we've got some chat books. You know, and from India, we've got a chapter, and from the Virtual African University, we have a chapter. From Canada, of course, you have to have something from Canada, and Nellie knows all about Canada. She's been there many times. Um, so MOOCs and Open Education around the world, lots is happening, not just here in Indiana and in the USA. And so 
my recent book on MOOCs and open education is actually titled MOOCs and education around the world and hence the title of this particular talk and I'll come back to that book in a little bit now my friend Glenn Jones who died this past year a picture of Glenn he had a book at one point called make all the world a school uh, or make all America a school I take that back and I think he should have named it make all the world a school uh, he had mind extension university at one point uh, and the first accredited fully online university, Jones International University. Anyhow, I like Glenn a lot, and I think, and I've, if you get a chance to read his bio, it's pages, pages, and pages long. Um, he was a cable TV magnet for a, a long time, but created TV stations to broadcast education around the world. Now, I don't think we should make all America a school. I think we need to make the world a school. Sorry, Glenn, I didn't mean to throw you. Um, and that's what MOOCs and Open Education enable us to do. Now, I'm a product of distance learning. I'm a product of MOOCs and Open Education, if you will, because I took, in 1984 and 85, I took correspondence courses to get into graduate school. I took television courses to get into graduate school. I'm a product of distance learning, a different form of distance learning, but my life changed. I was a boring accountant. Very boring person, and I wasn't allowed to wear pink at work as an accountant. No flashy ties or anything like that. Uh, everything was very boring. And um, but I got into the wonderful world of MOOCs. Got well later on. I got into MOOCs. Uh, I'll point that out in a little bit. Anyways, these notes are posted. If you want to download my slides, go to trainingshare.com. It's all just one word. Training, you might put a www before that, trainingshare.com, go under archive talks, and I just typed in the chat window, and you can access my slides. Uh, you can get the originals and use them. You can get the color PDF, whatever you'd like. Okay, where I went to school, when I escaped the cube farms of Milwaukee where I was working, I went to Wisconsin. And at Wisconsin, they were known for distance learning. They were known for uh, outreach. They were known for extension. They, in fact, in the 1930s, had massive open radio courses, or MORCs. Well, they didn't actually call it MORCs, but I just made that up. It was, you know, anyhow, they had typing courses, agriculture courses, home economics courses for thousands of people, masses of amounts of people taking these courses back in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And you see the little woman there checking, if you see her down below there, I don't know if I can get a pointer stick here, but let me see if I can grab a little pointer tool. If you see her right there, she's, uh, she's, tight. she's checking the radio transmission. Okay. And he's delivering a talk that's being transmitted to the far edges of the state of Wisconsin and maybe the world, okay? And that's what's happening with MOOCs today. We're transmitting courses, what we call X courses, X MOOCs. We're also creating collaborative teams in C MOOCs, connectivist MOOCs. We're also creating products and projects in P MOOCs. And we're handling professional development and lifelong learning in what's called PD MOOCs. Now, I'm working on a primer, an article on MOOCs that talks about these types of delivering education, these types of MOOCs. If anyone would like that copy, just send uh, me a, an email. We're entering this age of MOOCs. Whether you're technicians, learning about circuits and electronics, or you're getting refresher courses in finance, you're taking courses when you need them as you will. Okay? Poll number one. Who in here has taken a MOOC? Let me call up the poll that I've put up up here and try and broadcast this poll. I've not done this per se before, so let me try this. Um, have you taken a MOOC? Let me publish that. And the answers are yes, no. Option one, option, option one is yes, option two is no. And we'll share the results. And keep taking the poll. It looks like many of you have taken a MOOC. Okay. Interesting. All right. Let's go to the next one here. 
jot down in the chat window the topics of MOOCs you have taken. Oh my God, she's doing another MOOC. What topics have you taken in terms of MOOCs? I'm curious what people have done. Just type in the little chat window. I, miss, I know this might get a little crazy. It might get a little hazy. But go ahead, Olga, Diana, Roger, Mehmet, Mina, Jose, Grace, Nun, Susan, Louise, Renata, Bob, Hitish, Norma, Judith. Go ahead and type in the chat window what you've taken. I, in fact, have a screen that's so small I can't even read the chat window, but that's okay. Uh, you can read what each other is writing in there. And uh, I can maybe try and make my screen a little bit smaller so I can read some of it. But okay. Remember 2012 was the year of the MOOC? There was an article in the New York Times from Laura Papano saying, hey, this is the year of the MOOC. Some of you may not have read the New York Times that year that day. But I was interviewed for this article and I told my mom to subscribe to the New York Times and she did. For four months the article came out and my part was deleted. I'm not in this particular article but Stanford professors, Illinois professors and others were. And she pro pro projected that 2012 was the year of the MOOC where people were moving to massive open online courses. Massive open online courses equals MOOCs, the acronym. Uh, but it was the large universities, the prestigious universities that were doing You'll notice that you see a lot of MOOCs, a lot of cows with MOOCs. You also see a guy right here named George Siemens. Now, George Siemens has the preface, the first, we have two prefaces, the first preface of the MOOCs in Open Education book. He's a friend of mine, and I remember him offering the first MOOC back in 2008, or what some claim to be the first MOOC. Uh, so he's one person that we talk about in, in, the, in the book and has an opening in the book. Uh, Fred Mulder from the University of Netherlands, Open University of the Netherlands, has the second preface. You might also see this guy from EDX a lot in the news. I don't know if you can see my pointer there, but I'm assuming you can see my pointer. Um, so yeah, this guy here, I can maybe grab the, the little thing and circle him there. Yeah, can't even say his name. Anant Engerwald from EDX has been in the news a lot. When I got to Madrid, Spain a year ago, and I turned on the news, this program was being shown because of the unemployment rates in Spain at the time. People were taking MOOCs. There's a huge trend in taking MOOCs in Spain and in India and in Russia and other countries. Uh, so let's look at poll number two here. Poll number two is, are MOOCs disruptive? Let's see if I can grab poll number two and broadcast that for all of you to take. Let me grab that one. Uh, publish this one. <coughs> so one is yes, two is no. I'll share the results here. And the majority think they're not disruptive, that they're an extension of what we're doing. 21 people say they're not. Uh, more than, you know, well more than 50% of you have said that uh, they're not a disruptive force out there. So, okay, let's end that poll. I'll be back with more polls later. Clayton Christensen at Harvard is known for this notion of disruptive technologies. How about... Have any of you bought this book, The Invasion of the MOOCs? This particular book down here. I don't have a copy to show you because my students have borrowed it. I think Mina might have it. No, I'm just kidding, Mina. This gentleman over here at UPenn teaches 40,000 students mythology courses, whether they're coming from India or the Netherlands, Spain. Well, this book, MOOCs, The Invasion of the MOOCs, is capturing the insights of professors who are teaching courses. Now, I've just, in, oh, in, I've just written a a preface uh, or a foreword to a book coming out soon on MOOCs, and if anyone would like a copy of that, uh, it's a book that Bajor Khan and his colleagues have um, edited and put together with instructors talking about MOOCs and the problems of MOOCs and that kind of thing. Let's go to the third poll here and that one up. It takes a while because there's a lot of polls here. Let me pull that number three up. 
that are they disruptive? Okay, how many of you have um, yes or no? One is yes. It is free to download. Only a couple of you have. So I'm giving you something free to start with. I'll end. I'll also talk about one of my books that's free. So you get two free things. And the best question I get asked will get a free MOOCs book I will send to you somewhere in the world. Maybe I'll send two if I get two good questions. So we'll see. So the vast majority of not. Let me show you. And see, that most people have not seen that particular book. I will end that poll. And I'll end the polls for the time being. So I recommend that you know you got a free book to find out a little bit more about what's going on because you look at Detroit itself. The University of Michigan, which is right outside Detroit, offered MOOCs last year to more than three million. It's almost the entire size of the city of Detroit. In terms of MOOCs overall, 16 to 18 million people enrolled in MOOCs during 2015 so far. Uh, the vast majority are taking MOOCs from Coursera. I think that's the largest one, but Udacity, EDX, Udemy, NovoAd, uh, MOOC to Degree, um, Open to Study, Future Learn. Uh, there's a number of these uh, MOOC providers out there. The average enrollment is about 25,000 students in a particular course. And you look here, our data from just two days ago, I put in here from the US, um, looking at faculty encouraging people to use open source content. Whether you're in a small community college or institution, you can see from 2014 to 15, there's an increase. People are expecting you to do open education. The numbers are rising. The numbers are rising. Cumulative number of MOOCs didn't break 100 until 2012, the year of the MOOC. 2013 was the year of the anti-MOOC. By the end of 2013, it grew to over 800 MOOCs. And today, the number of registered MOOCs students is nearly three times, uh, nearly e equal to the last three years combined, I guess, is the number. So there's a lot of people enrolling in MOOCs, whether it's from Stanford or Harvard or MIT or the Open U in the UK or the University of Seoul or wherever you are. The growth of MOOCs, look at these, you know, Again, everyone's saying it's a death of MOOCs. I don't see any death. This is just from two weeks ago, numbers showing um, you know, how many people are enrolled in MOOCs. The growth, this is just the number, this is number, number of MOOC courses. Okay? The number of MOOC courses in the thousands of courses. So this is not going away anytime soon. You look at the providers here, Coursera number one, EDX right behind, Canvas, FutureLearn, Moret. Marienda, France University, you know, I can't say it, uh, someone's going to have to speak it for me, Udacity, course sites from Blackboard, NovoEd, and Iversity from Europe. There's a number of providers out there. You can see that Coursera has many partners, and that's why they've been able to jump ahead. So again, just, two, just this past week, the top 10 companies for getting money, two of the top 10 are MOOC providers, Coursera and Udemy in San Francisco, they have gotten over $100 million of venture capital to keep expanding. So people are investing in it. People are enrolled. Uh, people are providing courses in MOOCs. This, these are all recent October 2015 numbers. Okay, So there's a lot of things going on here at this time. And just two days ago as well, a focus on competency-based education where you can take tests and if you pass those tests you can get course credit without having to sit through the class again. So there's more of a notion on helping people get degrees and credentials for what they know and helping them get what they know through what they don't know through MOOCs. So a lot of interesting trends happening today. Learning has become more ubiquitous, more collaborative, more video-based, more massive, more open, more blended, more flipped. Uh, you name it, there are many ways that learning is changing in front of our eyes. But we're at a jumping off point. We don't know where we're going next. Many people don't know. I need you all to stand up with me because we're going to jump together. We're at a jumping off point. 
Okay, and I might lose the connection here because sometimes I jump too high. But if all the people in Europe could stand with me and all the people in America and South America and Africa and Australia and Asia and New Zealand and Antarctica, if you all could stand with me and I'm from Canada, no one cares about the Canadians. But let's get the Canadians and the Mexicans in too. All right, Central America. Uh, one, two, three, we're going to jump. One, two, three, jump. One more time. Let's just get the Europeans to jump. And maybe people from India as well. One, two, three, jump. And all the people from East Asia to jump with me. And there's nobody here from East Asia but Mina. Mina, you and I. One, two, three, jump. And all the people from South America. One, two, three, jump. And all the people from Canada. One, two, three, jump. And all the people from Africa. One, two, three, jump. And the Middle East. One, two, three, jump. I forgot. How about everyone all together? One, two, three, jump. Okay. I just wanted to move your brain a little bit. Because you didn't get any of this chocolate to get your brain going. Again, if you got here late, this is post-Halloween clock here. Okay, my hat keeps falling off, so maybe I should just take it off. All right. So we're at a jumping off point. I'm in China there, at, uh, in Shenzhen, China, a couple of months ago. You know how to jump there. I had to teach him how to jump, as you can see. A few people caught on. Uh, but we're at a jumping off point. We're really not sure where we're going, what directions we're headed. Things are heating up. This was the book cover we were going to use in the MOOCs and Open Education book. It would have sold more copies, but we decided to go with this book cover instead. My colleagues, Dr. Thomas Reynolds, Dr. T Tom Reynolds, Tom Reeves, Mimi Lee from University of Houston. He's from Georgia. He's from California at National University. We've been working for two years, nearly dying, doing a special journal issue on MOOCs and Open Education and a book on MOOCs and Open Education around the world. This is a lot of work, um, needless to say. And um, I'm still suffering from getting physical therapy on my knees from sitting too long, um, to be honest. So we did that. Well, first, we started with George Siemens, who did the first MOOC. He is now in Texas. He's no longer in Canada. He's at the University of Texas at Arlington. He's the director of the Learning, Innovation, and Network Knowledge Research Lab. There's an acronym for that. I think it's called LINK Research Lab. The link, he's, he's a linker. He's the connectivist person. He's the one who created connectivism with Stephen Downs, Canada. Um, the two of them offered the first MOOC in 2008. Anyways, he starts off a ch uh, the book with a chapter on opening up education for all, boosted by MOOCs. Um, actually, his I have the I have to apologize to George for a second. That's not the title. That's the title of the second forward. The title of George's forward is the role of MOOCs in the future of education. The second forward of the book by Fred Mulder gets at how do we consider MOOCs in terms of teaching, in terms of services, in terms of learner needs, in terms of educational resources, in terms of employability. Open education means many things, and Fred Mulder discussed that. He's the UNESCO Chair of Open Education Resources at the Open U of the Netherlands. In the first chapter of the book, David Wiley, who's well known for MOOCs, um, he talks about what openness means as well. Open assessments, open credentials, open educational resources, and open competencies. And he points out that a lot of MOOCs are not open. A lot of MOOCs are restricted. A lot of MOOCs require you to sign up for a certain period of time. And then when that MOOC is over, you exit out. They're not open forever, in effect. And so he's got some issues. We start them out with a couple of chapters that raise issues or problems, including Karen Head's chapter. And she talks about the fact that Many platforms and institutions do not consider people from outside the U.S. And so she points out that even courses that she teaches in literature, she has to be careful in because the Western literature might not be appropriate for the students that, she, that are enrolled in her classes. So she's got to consider many things, including the examples she creates, uh, in, in, including dress that she has on, the, the, the clothing. There are many cultural sensitivity issues that come out in her chapter that don't come out in the other chapters. And this coming Friday, uh, the, Dr. Reeves and Dr. Lee and I will be presenting in Indianapolis on cultural sensitivity in MOOCs. And if you're coming to the AEC conference in Indianapolis, you can hear us. If you're not coming and you want our handout, just send me an email um, and I'm happy to send you that. So she says that MOOCs need to expand in terms of thinking about other types of students, non-traditional students, um, 
you, it's difficult, though, to plan for everybody who's going to take your MOOC. The chapter from Japan, from the Open U of Japan, by Kamiko Aoki, she points out that Japan has been slow to adopt MOOCs, slow to jump in, in part because they weren't funded normally. Um, they weren't part of the funding cycle. In fact, online learning wasn't part of the funding cycle in Japan. And so she points out in her chapter how we're just getting in, and we're just getting started in some countries like Japan. There's a lot that we need to learn about MOOCs and open education. We're at the dawn of a new trend. And she goes through the history of Japanese open education and documents what's happened from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's a fascinating overview. In the fourth chapter of the book, we have the head of Merlot. Now, if you haven't been to Merlot, check out Merlot.org. Merlot is a website that offers you the capability of, of, of accessing free resources that are peer rated and evaluated. So Merlot started off as learning objects and open courseware and then open textbooks, and now we've evolved in, uh, to massive open online courses. What, what Gerald Hanley points out in his chapter on Mer MOOCs, Merlot, and education resources, it, things have evolved. It, it didn't, it, MOOCs didn't just emerge all of a sudden. There were, there were stepping points along the way. And some of us have been researching MOOCs and open education and open courseware. And uh, Gerald's been offering, uh, through Merlot, tens of thousands of resources that people have been accessing since the late 1990s. Uh, it's, it's got a conference at Merlot. There's a there's a newsletter. There's a journal called the Journal of Online Learning and Technology, the Jolts Journal. Um, so they have many things there at Merlot in addition to having the resources that you can tap into. So just pointing that out. In Chapter 5 of the book, I'm not going to go through all the chapters, just the first, just some of them. Um, chapter 5 of the book comes from Tasmania, Australia. Uh, and Karina Bazu and her colleagues David Bull and Mark Brown point out what universities and institutions need to look at in terms of the feasibility of open education and having a protocol for analyzing and, and, and evaluating those, looking at the challenges and the, the opportunities of open education. Chapter 6 comes from University of Cape Town in Africa and our friends uh, Laura is new. No, I can't even say it. Laura, Glenda, Cheryl, and Michelle talk about digital scholarship and how it's increased at the University of Cape Town. And you can see the numbers going up every year. Uh, and so the growth trajectory in terms of open education, in terms of digital scholarship, has to be something to keep in mind, okay, if you're moving in this space. And she points out some of the problems and challenges of open and digital scholarship in Chapter 6. In Chapter 8, we hear uh, from people back in the Down Under, back in New Zealand and Australia, on how they've taken MOOCs and provided some courses for indigenous studies, indigenous populations. And Maggie Hartnett, Mark Brown, and Amy Wilson um, did that with a couple of their courses. They also talk about designing a MOOC, so quite a bit about design. In And by the way, let me just go back a second. You'll see that um, this says uh, open to study right there. So open to study is a MOOC provider that Australians have used instead of Coursera for some things. Open to study. Chapter 10, we hear from Illinois Springfield who have analyzed MOOCs, uh, looked at the quality of MOOCs by vendor. They look at Udacity MOOCs, Coursera MOOCs, EDS MOOCs, Future Learning MOOCs. They've evaluated whether they are more objectivist or constructivistic, whether they're more um, uh, passive or learner-generated. In effect, looking at some variables, as you can see here, there are variables that they analyze these MOOCs on and um, the continuum that they analyze the MOOCs on. And they found certain things that were occurring in certain types of MOOCs, whether they're MOOCs on music or MOOCs on STEM, on science and technology, or MOOCs on business. There are certain trends that they found um, from Karen Swan and her colleagues at the University of Illinois Springfield. They actually have created a tool called AMP, a tool for characterizing the pedagogical quality of a MOOC. In Chapter 14, my friend Paul Kim had a MOOC on um, designing a new learning environment. He actually had a MOOC on how to design learning environments, and he sent out a notice 
on Twitter. He also sent out a notice while he was in Tanzania. My son was with him in Tanzania at the time, doing some mobile learning there. He sent out a MOOC explaining the purpose of the MOOC, the rationale. They had Twitter feeds. Soon, you know, they had almost 20,000 people sign up. His was more collaborative. His was more interactive. They used the Stanford Venture Lab for the MOOC, which eventually became NovoEd. If you haven't had a chance to see NovoEd, it's one of the more interesting tools out there. I'll type that in there. You might want to check that out. Um, it's got more tools for group teaming kinds of things. And so check out Paul Kim's. Um, he talks about creating an ecosystem. Now, you may have read my book, The World is Open. I'm using it to hold up my computer right now, but this is the book, The World is Open, how uh, web technology is revolutionizing education. I've got it underneath it. It's a, it's a, it holds this thing up. That's all it's good for. Um, well, in the book, I interview Paul, and he talks about creating the pocket school project where your teacher is in your pocket. You might have an MP3 player. I have my mobile phone here. You have your MP3 player, and you put it in your, your pocket, okay, if you will. And so that's kind of interesting right there. So creating an ecosystem for people to discuss and dialogue. And they did find that to be the case, that students were providing, whoops, I hit the wrong button. Hope that didn't affect everyone there. Um, I'll become more careful. Uh, can you all see this, I hope? The next slide is his colleague, Charlie Chung, who created Class Central. Now, Class Central, Class Central is a MOOC listing. Some of you are wondering well, how to find a MOOC. You can go to MOOCs list. You can go to Class Central. Class Central has, is an index of MOOCs. Down in Shenzhen, China, they're building an index of MOOCs for people in China. Um, hopefully, you all can see this in here. And if you can't, um, I'll just ask um, Nelly to uh, just... Boy, if Nelly, if there's anything goes wrong, just come back in on video and audio and let me know. I'll assume we're all cool because I can't read the chat window because um, my screen is small. Anyhow, you can see this group solicitation message and the discussion. If you could read what's in there, you see that people are providing resources for each other. People are offering services. People are, are offering support and help. There's a, a help system that's been built in the MOOC. Um, to get everyone to interact and discuss and dialogue in Paul Kim's MOOC. In Chapter 19, Sheila Jaganathan from the World Bank has MOOC that she talks about on poverty, on finance, on, on helping with climate change or understanding what climate change is. And so her chapter is fascinating in that regard. It was the first social kinds of MOOCs that were being offered at the World Bank Institute out of D.C. And they also at the World Bank Institute have started thinking about how to create communities of learning around MOOCs, how to create um, just-in-time learning activities. And so they're rethinking how they're delivering their instruction at the World Bank, uh, which is important. And especially important when you have tens of thousands of people looking at climate change and the issues surrounding that today. Chapter 20 comes from our good friend Zuraini Wati Abbas, who was at the Open U of Malaysia and now is helping in both Indonesia and Malaysia and has a chapter talking about both. And in the initial part, she talks about how many users there are of MOOCs uh, of the internet. And you can see China, India, Japan, Indonesia have the largest number of internet subscribers in Asia. And so she's in Indonesia and she's also in Malaysia. I was just I was recently in Thailand, uh, Vietnam a year ago. I just talked to South Korea from home yesterday, Philippines a couple of years back. He's, all these countries are leaders in terms of, of internet access, but are they leaders in MOOCs? Her chapter discusses localization of MOOCs or globalization of MOOCs from Taylor's University, which is offering a set of MOOCs, as well as from the Malaysian government. Taylor's University offering MOOCs, I believe, for both Indonesia and Malaysia. And she discovers how, discusses how to localize the content for that population. We also have a chapter from the Open U of the Philippines doing similar things. I don't have that up here but our friends Grace Alfonso and Melinda Bandalaria have a chapter there. We have chapter 22 from my friend Griff Richards there and uh, from Bakery uh, Diallo talking about Africa and how only 6% of Africans can access post-secondary education. And MOOCs might offer opportunities through the African Virtual University 
And so the AVU is, is exploring MOOCs, if you will. In Chapter 24, Allison, a company out of, out of Dublin, Ireland, is offering kind of corporate workplace kinds of MOOCs. Um, they're offering certified, certified learning and other things. Mike Farrick has a chapter there. Now, Allison uh, is more on the adult learning space, and they have learners coming from all over the world. They're coming from Poland and Australia and Fiji and New Zealand and the Philippines, and you can see all the other countries. There in Nigeria and so forth. They offer courses, and they're free, and they're paid by advertisements underneath. And they have some MOOCs like on Ebola crisis or on Asia, avian flu or whatever it happens to be. They were, they were helping people understand Ebola when there was difficulty information out there. They use MOOCs to help people understand sanitation issues and disinfection and all sorts of things there about a year ago. And um, they played a role. So MOOCs can play a role in social change, if you will. In, a, in Chapter 28, FutureLearn, Mike Sharples and his colleagues, um, Rebecca Ferguson and Russell Beal, they have a chapter that talks about the future and where we're going, whether it's future policies or funding or revenue generation or the environment. They have a chapter related to that and what's going to happen next. The final chapter is a chapter from my colleagues and I, um, from, from Tom, Re Tom Reynolds, Tom Reynolds, Lee and myself talking and recapping the book a bit and looking ahead. So that's some of an overview of the book. We, as I said, also did this other book. This, well, it became a special journal issue of the International Journal on E-Learning on MOOCs and Open Education. Both became available in July 2015, so just a couple months ago. I did a MOOC for Blackboard, and if you take, take my MOOC, you know I had to get in MOOCing stance to offer my MOOC uh, with my red glasses. Uh, I also have a free book. This uh, book is called um, is, uh, Tech Variety, uh, adding some tech variety. It's available in both Chinese and English for free, and uh, maybe soon Spanish, but Chinese and English. And it's up on the web, and it goes through 10 principles of motivation online. I'm not sure if you want to uh, get that or not. It's freely available. I'll put up a polling question. Maybe I have a polling question later on, but let's put the polling question here. See if I can get that one. Uh, the last polling question. Um, second last one. Let me publish this one. Have you downloaded my free book from techvariety.com? Have you downloaded the book? One is yes, two is no. Have you downloaded the, the book? And the vast majority have not. A thousand people have downloaded the book. Um, it's free. You can share it, download it, remix it. You can even, well, maybe not sell it, but at least you can use it and remix it while in that poll. And that one there. So that book, it discusses how to create a safe climate, how to encourage um, feedback, curiosity, uh, challenges, tension, and product-based kinds of learning environments. And as you can see there, it's got a Chinese version as well. You go to techvariety.com to get that free book. You see it right there, techvariety.com. Uh, so question for you. What are the problems that MOOCs and OER are supposed to address? Are MOOCs our solutions in search of problems in the chat window. Type in the problems that you think MOOCs might be able to address. What are the challenges that MOOCs might be able to address? What are the problems and issues that you think that you think are important? I'll let you type those in for a couple of minutes. And you know, if Nelly, if you want to just back in for a second on video and audio, or just audio and read a few things that people are typing in, I don't know if you're still there, Nelly. I just want to come back in on audio and read me a few things off of there. Okay. 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 
Okay, so certificates, value, credentials, some common themes are coming out. Go ahead. Okay, so sharing knowledge. I see Catherine typing and Jose's typing and Roger's typing. Yeah. So a couple. Yeah. Who? Who was that? Okay. Okay. So one question has to do with how do we get respect and um, support? And if you remember back in 2000, the same questions were asked about online learning in some ways that companies weren't supporting them, didn't think they were valuable. Times have changed. Fifteen years later. When we surveyed in the corporate space back, in, and Glenn Jones sponsored that study, whose book I had up earlier, you know that was an issue. People weren't familiar with them, but since that time, people have taken online. Learning. Their kids have taken it. They see the value of it. We also have a more hectic world than we had 15 years ago, and so online becomes a avenue for learning. And I think we're back in that same cycle of first there's awareness, then there's resistance, then there's understanding, then there's use, then there's sharing and advocacy. We're back in that stage one and two of awareness and resistance in terms of MOOCs. We're not quite at everyone you know, engaging in it, trying it out, and understanding what's possible. So we're moving along that point. What we see happening, our badges are one thing that's emerging, and there are organizations out there that are looking at the viability of badges. It's not my area of expertise, but Dr. Dan Hickey, Daniel Hickey, uh, at my university is, is one of the foremost experts. I typed his name in the chat window. If you type, if you go to his homepage, you can read a few ways in which uh, badges are being uh, ex researched and ex more accepted. That's the thing. I think. Coursera is offering more credentials. They're uh, charging people a fee for the credential, but they're creating ways to verify that that learner is there. Proctored exams or verified exams, and maybe I shouldn't be on the screen where the guy's got a gun pointed at you. I mean, that's maybe not the, the best screen here in the world. Um, I apologize. I'm not a gun holder of any kind. Um, most dangerous thing I have in my hand is a smiley ball. Okay, so maybe I'll just hold up the smiley ball for now and ignore the gun. Um, but corporations will tap in and are partnering with Coursera to get their employees credentials. Uh, some are, are partnering with Udacity and creating what's called micro-credentials, nano-degrees. The new trend today is nano and micro-credentials, small snippets, uh, which are um, often web design classes, codings, prog programming classes. Um, you might see management and leadership kinds of courses. If you, if you take a look at um, at Udacity uh, and there, and you type in nano degrees, you'll get a sense of what people are doing in this space and what kinds of areas are being credentialed today. Uh, what are the easier things to do? And one is coding that you can objectively score. But going back to your question about um, uh, how do we get employers to to accept that degree? One is having validated that that person is really the person who's there, whether it's fingerprint recognition, iris scanning, handwriting recognition. Some have keystroke recognition. Some have proctored examinations. There are a number of ways that you can get to enhance the the credibility of that certificate, of the person getting that certificate. I think there's... Uh, camera that checks the credentials of the person with Coursera. Um, there are all there are also are companies that come over the top to validate that that person is there and taking the exam. There are services that can be bought. Um, so those those are some of the the ways. So people can go to a center, and I'll I'll, I'll come back to that. Let me let me push on then a second. Unless there's another question, Nelly.
So some might give exams, some might have you do a project. So project-based MOOCs, P MOOCs, or professional development MOOCs might have you collaborate together to build something and do something, but some X MOOCs will have you do an examination or a quiz or some kind of performance measure. Um, and I, I guess the other kinds of performance measures would be to go through a series of case analyses and solve them or produce a product. There's all sorts of things that might be possible uh, to analyze. Let's look at 30 research topics. Uh, recent research topics include looking at dropout rates, which is an issue. But if you look after the first or second week, most people who hang around for a couple of weeks tend to stay. So it depends how you look at this. It, just like checking a book out of the library, how many p people actually read the book. Now, many people sign up for a MOOC with full intentions to finish it, but often drop out or never never come back after they've signed up. I, I'm, I'm a, I've signed up for many MOOCs I've never gone back to. Does that mean I'm a failure? Uh, does that mean I'm a dropout? I, I, I'd rather look at it as drop in. How many people dropped into the MOOC and came for week two or three and then completed it after week two or three? Just signing up is not enough. Uh, so I have a polling question. How many of you ever dropped a MOOC? How many of you ever completed a MOOC? Let's go back to the polling questions. Let's see if I can find those polling questions. OK, here we go. Let's see if I can go down to the bottom here. All right, so how many of you have ever dropped out of a MOOC? Yes or no? One is yes, two is no. OK. Now let me share the, the results with you. The majority of you have dropped out of a MOOC, so the majority of the people here are failures. I'm sorry to tell you all. No, you're not failures, I hope. Um, so I'll end that poll. Let me look at another poll here, right next to that poll. Um, how many of you ever completed a MOOC? Yes or no? One is yes, two is no. How many have ever completed a MOOC? Oh, a lot of people have completed a MOOC. And again, go back in the chat window, if you'd like, and type in the MOOC that you completed, if you remember what it was. I'll share the results. Most of you have completed a MOOC. Uh, go ahead, Nelly, you want to read a couple of the MOOCs that people have completed? Okay. Any titles? Any course topics? <laughs> I see many typing away. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm, could be. It might be interesting to find out what people actually remember the title of their MOOC. Um, I signed up for the sustainability one. I never went beyond the first lesson. I signed up for the history of the internet, uh, history, security, and technology of the internet from Chuck Severance at the University of Michigan, and I highly recommend that MOOC because he's got original footage from Utchley Park in the UK where they, the uh, the uh, code was broken during World War II. And computers really arose there. Um, so the, you look at here, the largest MOOC was 320,000 people uh, uh, taught from Udacity. So some of these are huge in size. Uh, research topic number two, what are the motivators of a MOOC? And I'm researching that. I've got a recent publication looking at motivation of open courseware. And you can see just trying to get an education, just trying to learn something, just trying to browse the content. Freedom was a big factor. Choice is a big factor. Uh, just, you know, learning on your own. Once they start to badge things and credential things, some people drop out of MOOCs in open education. Uh, research topic number three is engagement. How many people show up the first week versus come the second week or the third week? 
Um, so that's one measure of engagement, but people at Harvard are coming up with new measures of engagement uh, besides how many people show up. Uh, there are other ways to look at course materials being used, what's being shared, other measures that, you know, looking at, at a visual display. Here's a visual. There are visualization tools from MIT and Harvard that look at gender, age, course type, completions. This is an age one. The, the more green the the picture is the, the younger the person is. So you see in Russia and in China, Mongolia, other parts of the world, Northern Africa, very young populations. And in Mexico, whereas in the US and South Africa and Australia, a little older population came moves, not much older. We tend to see early on here mostly men, young people with college degrees taking MOOCs, not the underprivileged kids you see here, but in, in studies of Coursera, done at the University of Pennsylvania, two-thirds of people uh, of participants were coming from the developed world, not from the undeveloped world, which is not too surprising. That's research topic number six. So looking at, uh, at disadvantaged populations and underprivileged youth and so forth, the benefits for them. Research topic number seven might be looking at credentialing, which was the question we have. What's the value of the degree? The University of the People is a free university in the U.S. that's offering MOOCs and open education, um, and they're asking the questions, will people take the, uh, this degree seriously if it's free? Um, you know, what, how do you get people to take it seriously? Uh, well, one way to get people to take it seriously is to offer case studies of what people did with that content. And some of my research is interviewing people who have used OpenCourseWare, who have taken a MOOC, and getting them to dis discuss and describe what they're doing Okay, they've done with that content. In effect, looking at life change or life changes. Okay, um, so that's one thing that can be done to get people aware of possibilities for learning in this new fashion. Okay, so life change, life change becomes a big, wit, a big aspect of all of this. Okay. Localization of the content is another area of research. This gentleman in Korea, and I gave a talk to Korea yesterday virtually, a very short intro at the KIME conference, the 20th anniversary of the Korean Association for Information and Educational Media. Uh, this gentleman at Kyunghee University says we need open culture, uh, one culture MOOCs where Korean people can feel more comfortable in the MOOC or Chinese people or people in South Africa or Iran or wherever around the world or hum more humanistic MOOCs, less of this X MOOC drilling stuff and creating more social spaces, creating more, uh, more uh, culturally appropriate content, if you will. So looking at the localization content might be a research area, a hot topic today. Coursera is getting people to translate courses, a volunteer group. Uh, and in 2007, I actually researched the OOPS project, which was translating MIT content free to the world. My friend here, and I, my friend there, his name is, is Lucifer, not the devil, Lucifer Chu, self-named, beacon of light. He translated The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and made a lot of money. And then he took that money and he's translating MIT contents free to the world. Again, in my World is Open book, I interview him in the book if you want to read about Lucifer and what he's done to help the world. He took about 500 thousand dollars and created the largest translation team in the world uh, to translate content. The open courseware, uh, open source, open courseware prototype system or OOPS, the OOPS network he's got. So fascinating guy, Lucifer, with his largest translation team in the world. Number and geopolitical issues. In Syria, as we know, and in the paper yesterday, in the USA Today, two days ago, they talked about Syrian refugees who are learning from MOOCs, learning English as they migrate to, to Europe. This guy is a doctor in Syria, and he was learning online, and then the U.S. cut off block, even though Coursera had listed him as a success story in using MOOCs. All of a sudden, he went from a success story to not being able to access it because of U.S. government decision-making, which was changed. In, in a short order, people became aware of the, the need for these MOOCs to get out there for people in, in transition. 
So re research might be on geopolitical issues. Research might be on stuff strategies. My friend George Valencianos from Canada is looking at the silent learners out there and interviewing people on how they deal with their family life, how they deal with their work life while taking a MOOC, and what are their study strategies that they're utilizing to engage in MOOCs, participate in the MOOCs. Uh, and so you might interview someone from India like this gentleman here or this woman coming from Tennessee about what they're doing to survive and succeed in taking a MOOC. That gentleman from India taking a course in computer science during the nighttime and during the day he's a flyer, he's a pilot. You might also research this blended learning notion. There are centers being created in different parts of the world, if, whether you're in Kenya or you're in Madagascar or you're in Brazil. There are learning centers you can go to in the Ukraine and other places to meet and talk to other students who are taking the MOOC. So one area of research is researching the impact of blended learning with learning hubs and interacting with other learners about what they're learning and talking to them and discussing and dialoguing and creating that social presence and interaction. Another area of research is this notion of credentials and badges. What is the impact of offering these badges from Berkeley or for, from wherever around the world? Um, what, what is the respect they get in the workforce from having a, a certificate from Berkeley? I think it would be pretty prestigious for me to get one. Um, but when we interviewed some of, the, some of the learners, they said they just want to play around with ideas. They said too much informal learning wants to be badged too quickly. It's taking the fun out of it. If you badge in credential things, it's no longer fun for me. I'm no longer enjoying it because I, I have this test. I have this assessment. I just want to learn something. And now you want to test me. Okay. Yeah, so there's this quandary between free and open education and testing that free and open education for what people have learned. Because we've gone through decades of education if those of us with master's degrees or undergraduate degrees or PhDs have had so much education that's been badged or tested, finally, finally, we have an opportunity to learn on our own, okay? Now you want to test me again. Oh, I don't want to be tested again. Okay. So, October 1st, 2015, digital badges hit the big time, micro-credentials. This is a big movement. We are testing people. Colleges and universities are now offering digital badges as a form of micro-credential, small degree, sub-degree, small thing. There's actually a whole conference, first ever conference on outcomes-based education and micro-degrees and all this kind of stuff just a couple of months ago. Pedagogy. Karen Swan I had up earlier, and, and I noted that she's looking and using her AMP tool, uh, looking at at methods of assessing um, uh, the, uh, the structure, the learning that's taking place in a MOOC. What is the role of the teacher? What is the feedback that's provided? What's the user role? And then looking at are these X MOOCs, acquisition MOOCs, C MOOCs, participation MOOCs, or self-directed MOOCs? And then some might be more subjective, some might be more constructivistic. Some might be more passive or more active. So one area of research that I'm interested in is pedagogy that's used in the MOOC. And so my Tech Variety book that I threw behind me earlier, this one laying on the floor, has 100 activities that you can use and teach online. And this book's free, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm very interested in pedagogy and teaching with technology and thinking about how to motivate online. Number 15 is quality. This uh, teacher in Rwanda is teaching a course using MOOCs and open education that she found from MIT and other places. But how do we know the quality of that content? How do our supervisors understand the quality? What are the ratings? Well, you might go back to Karen Swan's piece that looks at the pedagogical aspects of the MOOCs. This is, a, this is one way to look at quality, one aspect of quality. Others, you know, there might be indexes or rating systems of MOOCs that eventually will come about. There actually is a, are tools out there. There actually are websites you can go to rate a MOOC. Uh, I th I th one is called Rate My Course, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. Uh, but there are MOOC rating systems out there. 
And some of you might type in the chat window if you've seen one of these that you can actually rate a MOOC and, and discuss it and dialogue about it. So number 15 are issues of quality. In the uh, special issue, Dr. Tom Reeves and I have a chapter or a final piece. In the final chapter or piece, the title is MOOCs Redirecting the Quest for Quality, Higher Education for All. I'm not sure if you can see that. If you're interested in our chapter on quality, send me an email and I'll send that to you. My email is easy to find. I'll type it in later at the end. So that's 15 research areas. There are 15 more. We're at the halfway point. In the chat window, could you write down one of those topics that you're interested in? And I'll have read those to me. So what topics might you be interested in in terms of research on MOOCs, the ones we just went through? Catherine's typing. Catherine's still typing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So finding out what students are actually doing, especially the quiet ones, getting more insight into the those that are not just lurking, they're actually participating. What's that? Ah, design. Okay. Thank you for mentioning design. We have a whole section in the MOOCs book that I really didn't talk about much, but Paul Kim has a chapter in there. We have six chapters. The largest section of the book is part five, designing innovative courses, programs, and models of instruction. So we do talk about that. And in the MOOCs special issue, there's a piece on the instructor role and what the instructors are doing. Uh, from my friend Sarah Havend and Cynthia Chandler. They talk about the emergent role of the instructor. Anything else? Yeah. And I should step a second. I'm stepping back, <laughs> stepping further back. I can just point out as I step back. back. So hence, no one can know everything about the research on e-learning, and and no one knows everything about MOOCs and open education, and so. I'm an expert, I think, at pedagogy, but these other areas, again, Dr. Dan Hickey is probably a good one to talk to about um, badging, and Dr. Tom Reeves about different expertises out there. Um, you know, once you tell someone you're into e-learning, they think that you can, everyone wants to know about copyright, quality, plagiarism, and assessment. Those are the four big questions. Quality, copyright, plagiarism, and assessment. And I used to do talks on each of those, but they're actually not interesting questions to me. I'm really more interested in motivation and the pedagogy side. But let's look at what other people are interested in. One area is mobile learning. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So your mobile phones. I, this is my brand new one. I broke one in Hawaii a couple of days ago when I was at a conference. So this is my brand new Samsung 6. Mobile, get in a little bigger screen. You can now learn from your mobile devices, whether it's an astronomy course or uh, a course in chemistry or, you know, um, biology, whatever it happens to be. On your smartphone, maybe your smartwatch, as you see down there. There's, there's, it's, education is going to smaller and smaller kinds of devices, if you will. And so, smartphones, smartwatches. And, and by the way, I'm going to make a comment, and this is going to jinx us. So far, so far, the Internet's working. <laughs> I'll probably be disconnected from the rest of this gigantic world in a second because I said it's all working fabulously well. Okay, and I'm assuming you can hear me just fine. Number 17 gets us into flipping the classroom. Flipping the classroom where my uh, the this guy here, Selman Khan, uh, has you know been teaching his nieces and nephews all sorts of high school content. People took that and uh, content and flipped their classroom. Watch Selman Khan videos. And, uh, you know, 
having you watch the video before coming to class, whether you're an accounting professor like this gentleman from Brigham Young University who retired, people are using his videos even though he recorded these before he retired. They flipped the classroom. In my P540 Learning Theories class on Tuesdays, we have eight videos that students can watch and we can flip the class and they can watch these ahead of time. I don't have to lecture as much, although I still walk through some of it. And we can do more activities around that lecture content, if you will. And so we're doing that Tuesday, as Mina knows. So one research area is what the benefits are of flipping. What are the challenges of flipping the classroom? And some people are using MOOCs. I have a study coming out next month in a journal on a Chinese instructors flipping their class with MOOCs from other people. They're not in their own lectures. They're using lectures of someone else to flip their class. Now, what I'm doing in my class is I'm having students in some of my classes where they can watch a MOOC, and Mina did this maybe, watch a MOOC and, and of a similar class to my class, write a paper on it, and get credit for it in my class, substitute it for an assignment. So in effect, they're taking that MOOC and my class, double exposure. So a lot of research questions around this notion of reutilizing content, blending your classroom, flipping the classroom with MOOCs. A lot of pedagogical questions on, on video, how to use these videos more appropriately. And lynda.com, which you may or may not be familiar with, lynda.com is used here at Indiana University to train our faculty and students about technology. They just bought... Uh, or just were purchased by, I should say, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming many of you are LinkedIn users. I mean, we could uh, we could try this. I've never, you know, um, try and create a poll real quick. But it looks like my polls. Uh oh. Let me try this again. There we go. I can create a poll. Uh, how many use linked? In. I'll just do a yes, no, yes, no. All right. So try that one out. Let's see what people say. Yes, no, yes is one, two is no. You share the results. A lot of people are LinkedIn users. Not everyone. But a lot of people are LinkedIn users. Okay, so Lynda.com was just bought by LinkedIn by for a billion U.S. dollars, a billion and a half. Learning's become more visual based, and MOOCs are part of this trend. There's a lot of research questions that need to be asked about the appropriate use of video visuals, about creating a macro context around the videos, a sharing context around the videos. Uh, I actually have a paper I published on 10 ways to use video from a, a learner-centered point of view and 10 ways from an instructor-centered point of view. It's free at my website, publication, publicationshare.com. If you want to go to Publication Share, I think that's 2012. You can find that article, publicationshare.com. And many articles, the preface to the MOOC is there. Number 18, cost-benefit analysis. There's This gentleman over here is the head of Arizona State, which is creating a freshman academy, a global freshman academy with MOOCs. He's also letting Starbucks people, uh, he's partnered with Starbucks to create free content for their um, baristas, the people making the coffee, okay? Or the tea, which I just have in my hand. So... There's a big push today to look at cost-benefit analysis of these contents, okay? Um, they went with two years free college. Now it's four years free college at Starbucks. If you work at Starbucks, you can get online education, some of its MOOCs, not all of its MOOCs based, uh, for free, if you will. And at Georgia Tech, I'll come back to Georgia Tech here in a little bit. Community colleges, Obama wants to have community college free. It will not happen before he's... Um, no longer president, but sometime this will happen in the next five or ten years. Community college or some aspect of it will be free to, free to everyone in the U.S., Canada, and maybe the world. It already is in many places, in Germany places. It, at George, Georgia Tech University, they have a master's degree at a very low cost compared to the face-to-face -face degree. They're offering courses through MOOCs at a low and reduced price, if you will. And they're building a pipeline of talent for computer science. It's a computer science area. They have chapter 14 of the book. I'm pretty sure it's chapter 14, Richard DeMille. 
uh, who actually has a new book on the revolution in higher education, Richard DeMilo. He'd be a good one to look up. Let me type his name. And again, he has a brand new book that uh, I just bought. That's, and I think it's chapter 14. Yes, he's been around the block. 13, Unbundling Higher Education at, and the Georgia Tech Online Masters in Computer Science. Research question number 19, nano degrees and micro-credentials. Google's partnering with people and you know, Sony and, and Volkswagen and Honda uh, and, and, and Amazon are partnering with providers of MOOCs to create nano degrees, short burst degrees, to get them the skills that they need in computer programming, in web design, in graphic design, in imaging, or whatever it happens to be, in maybe some healthcare related areas as well. But in fact, MIT is creating a new master's degree out of a half MOOCs. They let people take half of the courses in MOOCs. This was announced this month, uh, well, I guess October now. We're in November 1st. October 7th, MIT announced that students can take half of the master's degree for free online and come to MIT for one semester and finish their master's. How many of you knew that? I'm just curious. Let's create a poll. Let's create a poll. How many are aware of the MIT blended master's half free? Okay. Yes is one. Two is no. Let me save and publish. See if you are aware of this or not. Let me share the results. Most of you are not even aware of this, okay? Um, this is brand new. Some of you are. Okay, a few of you are. All right, let's end that one. So this is, this. there's so much news. It is hard to keep up. It is hard to keep up. So this talk today, this I guess she's calling it a keynote, but whatever we call it, this talk today, the intention of it is not just to talk about my book, uh, blah, blah, blah. I, you know. The intention is to update you on the state of what's going on. I'm trying to give you both the applications and the news as well as some research clues. Okay, I'm trying to give you a little insight of what's being researched, but while I'm showing you these particular studies or, or these topics, of potential research, I'm trying to give you the current news that are, is going on. So I'm trying to give you a primer here, a bit of a primer on the state of MOOCs and open education around the world. Number 20, accessing experts. This gentleman who was at Iowa State just quit his job. He's now offering MOOCs. He moved back to Canada. I don't know if anyone moved to Canada. Who cares about Canada? I'm sorry, Nelly. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> he's from Ottawa, which no one cares about there either. I know you like Toronto. I like Vancouver. Um, Toronto's okay. Anyways, this guy missed Canada so much, he quit his job, he had tenure, and he was teaching courses in his basement using Udemy. U-D-E-M-Y. Udemy. They're out of San Francisco. He was courses on critical, critical thinking. So if you want to take a course and put on your critical thinking glasses and do a critical thinking course, you can take Kevin D. LaBlante's course on critical thinking and pay him a little bit of money if you want to. You can sign up. There's a might be a you know, monthly fee, subscription fee to get his newsletter or something like that. So some people are quitting their day jobs to do MOOCs. And experts on the web are all around us today. And there are many places to find experts besides Udemy. You can go to, if you work at Google, they have something called Googler to Googler. They have a website for Google employees to share with other Google employees about parenting, management, money and banking, mountain climbing, fitness, whatever it happens to be. Corporate MOOCs are coming. There's cafes. Noodle is a cafe to meet experts at. Noodle. There was something called Google Helpouts that didn't last too long. But expert cafes. There actually is something called the Expert Cafe. And Noodle and various other interesting websites where you can find experts. This kid here became a junior golf champion around the world a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago now, 
from, he's from India, and he had learned golf on the sugarcane fields of India and from watching Tiger Woods videos. He's learning from open access content. He was learning from free and open stuff. That's how he became the top golfer in the world, learning by watching. Uh, Bandura in Social Learning Theory talks about this. Mina might remember it from class a few weeks ago. Maybe not. Maybe her brain is dead. Give her a break. It's her first semester here. So this kid here is learning from open contents. What can you learn from open contents? So part of my research is looking at how people's lives are changing from open contents, including MOOCs. I think open contents is the big umbrella. MOOCs are underneath it. Many places are thinking MOOCs are the big thing. MOOCs aren't the big thing. Open education is the big thing. Opening up the world to learning is the big thing. Sharing our learning ideas is the big thing. You see, all these other things are derivatives, and there are derivatives of MOOCs, like P MOOCs and C MOOCs and PD MOOCs and X MOOCs and all sorts of things. There are many other types of MOOCs out there. Anyhow, Udemy. You might get an email to build your self-confidence. You might need more self-confidence. They told me I needed self-confidence. You think I need self-confidence? We should have a polling question on this. <laughs> Maybe I do need some self-confidence. Anyhow, emails coming in from you to me. I need a web design class or all these courses down below here, you see. Okay? So experts, these experts are available to you all the time. Whether you're getting the experts from Udemy or Noodle or the Expert Cafe, this is a change in society. No longer do we need to go to university for so many years to get the experts, you see. Number 21, MOOCs for social impact. I kind of alluded to this earlier, but now there's something called GROOCs or GROCs. GROOCs. MOOCs for groups to change the world. We all want it. How do you say it? Rooks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, can you hear me? I'm assuming you can hear me, Nelly. But, Grooks, this is a new area social change for social impact. Mooks that can change the world. Why not change the world? So, you might have a, a group that meets, or group that meets, like groups to look at climate change or look at pollution issues or whatever the topic happens to be. You have some face-to-face -face meetings, some online meetings, blended approach. Number 22, who benefits from MOOCs is one area. And how are people benefiting? In terms of careers, some are finding a new job or starting new business or get a pay raises or getting promotions. Some are enhancing their current job, changing their careers around a little bit. In terms of educational benefits, you might have prerequisites that you complete to get into college. You might have more global knowledge that you need to study in the field. You might have some, some gaps in your knowledge that you fill in with the MOOC. That, that's a big trend today, is filling in the gaps in one's knowledge to prepare you to come back to college or to get a job when your university didn't offer a course in a specific area that's now a trend that people want you to take. You got a degree, you got a certificate, and you're fine. You just need that one more experience to get a job. So that's another area that MOOCs can help in is the gap area. You might also find, you also might find a university to enroll in through a MOOC. I have an article called 30 Reasons Why People Share, 30 Reasons, Reasons to Share. If you want that article, it's free at publicationshare.com. If you can't find it, send me an email. It's 10 Reasons Why Universities Share, 10 Reasons Why Students Want to Use the Shared Stuff, and 10 Reasons Why Professors and Instructors and Educators Share. So who's benefiting career-wise? Who's benefiting educationally? Number 23 is survey research on OER awareness. There's a dozen studies out there on, are faculty members aware of open education? Oh, you can read this study over here from the U.S. of A, and it says, no, they're not aware of it at all. And then you can read a study from Britain, from the U.K. They're aware of it, and their study's a global one. Don't read U.S. research. It's junk. Just go to the U.K., read this. Sorry, Mina, you shouldn't have come here. You should have gone to the U.K. Read this study. Okay, just kidding, Mina. Read this study, OER Evidence Report, and they, they, they came out almost simultaneously. 
And was it, what my point is here is don't believe stuff from one study. We overgeneralize one study or one finding or one aspect. Oh, University of Florida published on economics course where online students did worse than face-to-face -face by a half a point. Oh, pull in arms about that one study of a half a point when there are 200 studies showing the opposite. Be careful over generalizing the research. And read the stuff out of the Open U in the UK. It's high quality content. I'm not saying the US is not high quality, okay? Um, I'm not, okay, Elaine and Jeff, I mean, if you're watching the show here, um, good stuff from Elaine and Jeff uh, every year from the, from the people at the Sloan Foundation. Number 24. What are people actually using in terms? Not so. The previous question was awareness. Are you aware and using this? This study is. Are you? How are you using open educational contents like Nature magazine or journals? Open contents. There's so many journals today that are free to access. The Public Library of Science is one. The International Review of Open of Research on Open and Distance Learning (IRODL) free journal. There are many free journals, Jolt I mentioned earlier. How are we using it in our classes and to, to learn? And how is this a supplement? How is this a supplement to our learning? How are MOOCs a supplement? How is OER a supplement? Filling in the gaps of our weaker spots. So if Mina takes my class and doesn't learn a lot on learning theories, can she take a class, a better class than mine, and learn more stuff? And of course she can. It can fill in the gaps. So research area number 25 is supplementing your learning augmenting your learning, and enhancing your learning. We're going back to my blended learning handbook of 2006. This gentleman here took 250 MOOCs. 250 MOOCs, he's crazy. And he passed them all. He's got some kind of credential from each one. Case studies of MOOCs can help convince the rest of the world. So the earlier question I had was about how to get people to accept MOOCs. Well, case studies can do that. You can talk to Ms. Mr. Nagai who took 250 MOOCs. So we're getting near the end of time here. So you can find out about the guy who took and passed his, his undergraduate marketing degree online at age 80 years old, OK? Got a degree. You can find out about yak herders in Tibet getting open Yale English classes and becoming English teachers. We need case studies of success. To me, this is the most important aspects of MOOCs. It's not that retention and completion rates. It's not the assessment issues. It's case studies of life impact. How are lives changing? My life changed from correspondence and TV courses. Their lives are changing from open education and MOOCs. I have a 51-year-old male, 51 to 50-year-old male, who took calculus online to get ready for college and his master's degree because he had left 28 years earlier. MIT Open OCW changed his life. I've, we interviewed a, a teenager who also changed his life, entered into physics after watching an MIT physics professor. He became excited about physics. We interviewed a 70-year-old photographer who retired and started a, a digital photography website after taking open education courses. We interviewed someone who started a new business and uh, created a small business. Uh, not a lot of income, but enough to supplement and buy Christmas gifts or something. Uh, around the world for someone else, or birthday gifts, I should say. Number 27 is high school. Now we're moving down to lower grade levels. We're going down to the high school level. It was pushing up to the corporate space, okay? Now it's pushing down to little kids, getting them ready for, high school, uh, for college, getting in the, the study skills, the writing skills, the reading preparation. In this special issue, we have a chapter on readiness, um, students readiness, let's see the exact title of this chapter, uh, Developing MOOCs to Narrow College Readiness Gaps, the Challenges and Recommendations for a Writing Course. My friend Shoba and Christopher Devers, Shoba Andy Rao from a community college in Manhattan wrote this with uh, Chris Devers from Indiana Wesleyan. This is the area that needs to be explored today is preparation, readiness, remedial education. So, Professional development MOOCs, alumni MOOCs, remedial education MOOCs, filling the gap in MOOCs. There are a lot of things that people hadn't planned on. Syrian refugee MOOCs. It's not just about replacing traditional classes. It's about supplementing, augmenting, finding the gaps in what higher education has never done. Like high school kids getting these courses ready, getting ready through that, that content. 
So you might take a Spanish course, you might take a geometry course or something else. And we have six minutes left, and I'm on number 28 out of 30. Three more. How do you find MOOCs? Some of your questions might be on finding MOOCs. Well, the MOOCs list is one place. Class Central is another place from Charlie Chung and his colleagues. Find a MOOC on creativity. Find a MOOC on web design or on management or whatever it is. Class Central is the place to be. MOOC list is a place. Open Culture is a third one from Stanford. Open Culture is a third place to find MOOCs. And then a research might be on unique pedagogy. If you have ever seen Star Trek, the movie or the show, there's actually a MOOC being offered right now from Syracuse on Star Trek. Some people offer MOOCs on television shows or popular movies. And they might dress in crazy gear like my helmet earlier from yesterday's Halloween party. So you might, you know, dress as, you know, someone from Star Trek or Star Wars or some other movie that you like. So unique pedagogy, debates, role plays, cross-cultural exchanges. My students did wiki books with students from China and Malaysia and Taiwan. And we did case analysis with students from Finland and the UK and Peru and Korea. Unique pedagogy out there is important. And finally, cultural differences in MOOCs. In China, they've renamed this building the MOOCs Times Building. They actually named a building the MOOCs Times Building of China. And I went in that building a couple months ago and got a tour of the building and met entrepreneurs who are starting up companies doing all sorts of interesting things like test preparation classes and the language learning classes and gaming classes. Here's a quote I'll end with. The most memorable line from my visit to China was this. We have 12 million K-12 teachers in China who need to receive this particular in-service training. So we started with a small group, this small group of 200,000 people. In China, small, Mina, small is 200,000. In most countries, small is 10 or 20. But in China, it's, you know, we can try a lot of things out with MOOCs. <laughs> so I think that's it. Let's look at the last polling question. Would you like to research MOOCs now? Let's pull up the polling question, see if I can find it up on the top here. I actually have a couple polling questions I can call up here. Let's see if I can find this one. Uh, come on, Kurt. Move a little faster. Okay, so there's the publishing. This one. Would you like to research MOOCs now? One is yes, two is no. Let me share some of the results. The vast majority would like to, sh to research them now. I've got you excited. Good. I've done one thing. You're excited about research. All right. Let's see if I have another polling question. I think I do. I have a, polling, I have a couple more polling questions. Um, let's publish this one. Have you downloaded the free preface from the MOOCs and Open Education book? Have you downloaded the preface? One is yes, two is no. It's free at MOOCsbook.com. I guess you don't see this one because no typing anything in here. Oh, there we go. Let me share the results. Most of you have not. So go to MOOCsbook.com, get at least a free part of the book. I have another polling question, I think, up here. I'm not positive, but I think I have one more to end with. Um, let's see. We did the tech variety. Who would like to teach... Or who would like to take, I have two more, who would like to take a MOOC? One is yes, two are no. Who would like to take a MOOC now? <laughs> oh, you all are doing that one. Okay, great. Now, let me ask a harder question. Who would like to teach a MOOC? Okay, so let's see, let's see if I can find this one. Teaching a MOOC. i got to go through a lot of questions. Here we go. Publish this one. I'd like to teach a MOOC now. The vast majority would like to teach a MOOC. Some of you not. Okay. I think that's all the questions that I have so far. Um, so there's my slides. Are at my slides are at trainingshare.com, papers at publication share, free book at Tech Variety, free preface at MOOC's book. I want to thank you all for coming in today. It is 2.30 exactly, an hour and a half after we started, um, approximately. I do want to have a couple questions, if we have time for a couple more questions, Nelly, before we close here. Is that possible, or do we need to... Yes. 
so okay so who's going to ask me a question we had one so far that was a good question we'll see who else has you can send me her name and if you send yeah where is she from Oh, that book will never get there. <laughs> <It's just kidding. laughs> the, the authors. Of <laughs> Tried sending some books to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've been invited to to Johannesburg and Pretoria a couple of times. I haven't gone. Uh, conflicts, conflicts. Um, Karen Lazenby is down there, and she has a chapter in my blended handbook. Karen Lazenby, but um, and she's still doing great things. Um, if you if you've seen her, um, she's been to Ed Media a couple of times. Uh, some good mobile projects down in South Africa. Okay, any other any other questions? People are shocked. That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. You know, and what the Indian population has tried to do is to create a similar thing to what MIT has done. In fact, I talk about it a bit in The World is Open Book. I talk about what was happening not quite a decade ago, but the, the, the technology uh, universities, the high-level technology universities, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of them, but you'll know uh, in, the ch in the chapter I have in here, I think it's chapter four or five, uh, we discuss what's going on in India. Um, Let's see if I can find the name of the. Yeah, here we are. Well, it's taking me because of the sake of time here. I mean, I just I'll just say that the here we go. MIT offspring. So there are a number of offsprings that have, you know over the past couple of years. In addition to uh, what's going on at MIT, some things in Brazil, some things in. in IIT, that's what it is, the IITs. Uh, Indian Institutes of Technology have tried doing MOOCs. They're actually in the chapter of the book on, uh, on what's going on in terms of mobile learning to farmers in India. There's a chapter from the Commonwealth of Learning in the book, and that chapter is chapter number 18, Changing the Tune, MOOCs for Human Development. And in there they talk about how to make MOOCs available at, with the resources that are there. And so they're trying to create content with the lowest level of, of resources. So they're sending some, some things over a text as text messages over mobile devices to help farmers learn about agriculture and learn new methods of agriculture. So it's not just about translation to other dialects or uh, languages that are spoken in India. But it's also about creating content at the at the level of the technology. Also in India, you know, of course, they're trying to create the ten dollar laptop. They're also trying to create one dollar flash memory sticks, and so they're trying to create technologies that are cheaper. They're trying to utilize the cheapest technologies that are available, and p some people are translating content. There are, there are a number of initiatives going on in India at once, and some of it is uh, utilizing, some places are using the Khan Academy videos. Existing resources are being used in schools in India where there aren't teachers to teach math. They're using Khan Academy videos for that. So. Yeah, that's a great question. There's much I could answer about that. It, it's got to be a systemic. It's, it can't be a one-off answer to the, the issues of India or China or other countries. Other questions, Nelly? I see that. Yeah, I see that. Yep, I'm there. I see it. Okay, so I do. I do. Yeah. 
What's the best way to maintain student engagement in MOOCs? Well, I don't know if there's a one best way, but what I did in my MOOC, and I have, I have ten. And this is from Bob LC. Uh, so, so Bob, what I did in my MOOCs to maintain engagement, I had polling questions built in. I had some fun stuff built in. I had two assistants next to me who were reading questions to me from the, during the MOOC and would hand me slips of paper of questions that the audience had. So I didn't have to do the cut and paste. I had, I had two assistants who played guitar during break times. I had entertainment. It was like a radio show. Uh, so make it, entertain, make it an event. You know, make it a fun happening event. I also included people's pictures. I, the last week of my MOOC, I collected pictures of people around the world who were taking my MOOCs. I had them on the screen. They got recognition. We shared information about them. So polling questions, personalization is important. Uh, I brought my globe in, and we, we had slips of paper where people were coming from. Uh, early, early people who, who showed up a half hour before the class time, we put their name on parts of the globe. So I tried personalizing it that way during the synchronous sessions. During the asynchronous sessions, what we tried to do is have a recap, recapping what happened during the week, sending a, a summary list, sharing what, what went on during the list, during the week. That was also important. So uh, the recap, the summary, um, the personalization, dividing up the feedback. I had 10 helpers or eight helpers, and and they volunteered out of their own kindness of heart to give feedback to people. And one woman gave feedback to everybody. She was crazy. She was, she was in there all the time giving feedback and lending feedback to folks. So feedback becomes part of it. Um, personalization becomes part of it. Um, uh, alternating synchronous and asynchronous. So you don't have, you know, some people can't access the, asynch the synchronous. You might record the synchronous so that if you can't access the synchronous or you've gone to bed during the synchronous time, you, it's available. So I've got 10 or 20 ways on how to help teach a MOOC. And in the primer we're doing for a book uh, by Bob, uh, uh, an edited book from Bob Reiser at Florida State, we're doing a book for a, a, an intro book in ed tech, ed educational technology. We summarize book, MOOC business plans, types of MOOCs, and, and design principles and the history of MOOCs. If anyone would like that, we're working on the paper. We're, we're just finishing the chapter right now. And I'm happy to share our version. Um, but there are many. So the engagement can be pedagogical engagement, but it can be other things as well, Bob. And, and, and you know, it might be through just talking. It might be through wearing fancy glasses and having prompts and smiley balls and things like that, you know, that you're waving away. All these things combine. You know, giveaways and recaps and per and just caring about people. Let's see if I have another question. Below Bob's question, Aslin Ferreira says, what's the first step to develop a MOOC? The first step in developing a MOOC, I didn't abide by. People twisted my arm to do a MOOC. I think the first step in doing a MOOC is to see if there's a, uh, an audience for it and do a survey of who wants it. Uh, I'm not sure if Blackboard did that when I did a MOOC with them. So... But they knew people were using Blackboard to teach, and they wanted to help people learn how to teach online. Um, people were using the free course sites. So I think the first step is doing that. I think just the first step is looking at what resources you have. So surveying people, look at the resources that you have, summarize those resources, collect more resources, um, talk to someone. Just Look at MOOC's list in Class Central for similar classes and write to the instructors who have taught a similar class and get their feedback on what didn't go well and how they should start and how they might end and all those kinds of things. So the first step is many steps, actually. Again, everything is systemic here. Um, recruiting and help and support might be a first step. You might not want to jump in until you know you have a, a, a former student who wants to help you or a, a five or six former students who want to help you. So those, that's another question. Um, what uh, Raf Fiella asks, what changes will there be in MOOCs to cater for needs? Well, MOOCs are in, we're in stage one right now. We're not in stage three, four, or five. We're maybe heading to stage two or version two of MOOCs. But what what um, what changes are going to be many. One is going to be this notion of, of the cafe where we meet people in a face-to-face -face setting while taking a MOOC. There's going to be more and more places to go and stop. 
Chuck Severance at Michigan does a MOOC where he meets people. He flies around the world when he travels and meets people in cafes to talk about how they're doing in the MOOC. Uh, just having office hours in a hotel lobby. Uh, those things are going to be more and more common where you meet your instructor when they just happen to be flying into town. I know that sounds ridiculous or impossible, but look at Chuck Severance's MOOCs at Michigan. I'll, he's got a chapter in our book. I can type in his name in the chat window. Charles severance and he does a MOOC called programming for everybody and he has a MOOC on the history of the internet a MOOC on Python programming he has a top MOOC from Coursera the top most searched for MOOC because uh, Python programming is popular and he's very popular so changes will include those personalizations the changes will include more visualization tools of participation the changes will include automatic translation so that you will get things sent to you according to your language. Um, changes will include more study buddies, more people to help you uh, negotiate that MOOC experience. Changes will also include more acceptance and credentialing of the MOOCs and small snippets to create uh, a certification or a master's degree. There are many things that are going to change uh, in the coming years. And who was at Beijing Normal this summer when I was in China and then decided to come to IU and uh, attend our doctoral program. Well, I think she had already decided, but anyhow, it was nice to meet up with someone who came to IU um, just a couple months after my trip. She's heard me speak about MOOCs and open education, but I hope this is new for her. You can hear me now. Good deal. Okay. Hey, everyone. And I see Mina's here from my class. Mina.